When was the last time you said goodbye? Do you remember what you said? Well, for me, I say take care a lot, especially to those I'm very close to. And I think it's very interesting how by adding those two words, we could show such endearment. So much so that care could feel so inherent, even through this very brief exchange. But what I think it really means is that care existed the moment the conversation began and extends well beyond goodbye. Now, I want you all to think about the people that you're surrounded by every day. That could be your friends, your family, your colleagues, even your desk mate. How do you know if they care about you? Is it the words of affirmation they give you? Or the acts of service they do? Or hey, it might even be something that they don't do. But what exactly is it that gives you that confirmation that you're being cared for? And again, like many of you, a lot of factors are coming to my mind, but there isn't a specific indicator. And as I grow older, I realize that there will not be a specific indicator, and that won't be one defining trait, and that this seemingly simple question might be a bit more complex than I initially thought. I think before we fixate on searching for signs of care, let's first dive into the concept of care itself. The real question that we should be asking is, why do we care about certain things? It's not like we're obligated to care. But the answer is actually surprisingly simple. The things that we care about, they're the things that give us character. These are the things that drive us, the things that motivate us, the things we wake up to do, the things we devote our time to. Teachers teach because they care about shaping the next generation. Activists protest because they care about making a difference. And doctors, they dedicate their lives to medicine because they care about their patients' health. I realize that care is truly embedded into everything that I see. And what I realized was that care was not the outcome of something. It's not like I only care after I've done a set list of things. But care is more like a byproduct of these three things. Understanding, acceptance, and practice. So today, we're going to explore what I'd like to call the prologue to caring. These are the introductory blocks to help us empathize understand and truly care about the world around us. Now, page one of this prologue is about understanding because ultimately, the greatest form of care can only come once we've casted our own aversions aside to make way for new forms of understanding. My definition of understanding is my own interpretation of a narrative. It's something that's not rigid, something that's subject to change. And I think, in, I think care in many ways is just the same. You know, we change our forms of care as our interpretation changes. Now, I think in order for us to truly care about something, we also have to understand that understanding does not necessarily mean justification. We don't necessarily have to agree with everything that we learn, and we don't have to implement everything that we learn into our lives. But the undeniable truth is that there are some things in life that are mislearning opportunities as a result of misinterpretation. And to really understand this, we have to embrace the unconventional. We have to learn from things that we've been told to unlearn. For me, growing up in an Asian household meant that my family loved mahjong, especially during Chinese New Year. I remember I would sit next to my grandparents for hours and I would beg them to teach me how to play. But although my grandparents really loved it, my parents hated it, seeing it as gambling, destructive and addictive, the same way that drugs and alcohol are destructive and addictive. And I think gambling lies in this very interesting moral gray area, as do many things that we see today. But the current research we have on gambling is very much skewed towards compulsive gambling, but that's like studying alcohol and only focusing on alcoholism and ignoring fine wine. We're so used to portraying these unconventional practices in black and white, so you see, it was a problem with our narrative all along. And what we don't talk about enough is that genuine care requires us to question the conventional. We have to test our own limits of understanding if we want to have the capacity to care. So with that being said, what if I say that there are a handful of life lessons that you can learn from a single game of poker? 
Poker players have an undeniable edge when it comes to deducing another person's psychology through very limited information. Through recognizing patterns of play, to negotiating, to bluffing, to understanding body language, these things can help them maximize their success. They then use this information to make a decision based on calculation and intuition. But these skills, they're not restricted to gambling. More importantly, they're transferable skills to other aspects of life, whether that be dealing with clients or making financial decisions or judging cost-benefit analyses. Gambling is also interesting because it provides us a very unique opportunity to learn about this concept known as financial abstraction. Now, this is a notion about where money becomes more and more like an idea, therefore more abstract and less tangible. So you're all familiar with the poker chips that we use at casinos, right? So a single chip, in theory, can represent any sum of money. And we've likened thousands of dollars to a single chip. So as you can see here, on the left, this poker chip is worth $5,000. And on the right, that's $5,000 in cash. So they actually represent the same amount of money. Now imagine this. You're playing poker, you're in your last round, stakes are high, adrenaline is rushing in. How much easier do you think it is to take that $5,000 chip and put it onto the table compared to if you actually had to take $5,000 in cash and put it onto the table? For me, I think I would take a lot more time to consider if the bet was actually worth betting if I physically saw the money in front of me. So you see, it's a very different story when money is actually tangible, when we can actually feel the money. And this explains why it's so dangerously easy it is for us to use things like Apple Pay or Venmo or PayPal. It's because of that cognitive distortion of money. So you might ask, so where's the silver lining in all of this? If we never took time to embrace the unconventional, we wouldn't even be able to see that this was happening to us right now. Cryptocurrency and online transfers, they will be the future of banking. So now that we know all of this, maybe we can take some time to reconsider how we use our finances or how we can implement some control to our spending habits. But my overall point is this. If we can take something so controversial, something so unpredictable in its nature, something like gambling, and yet we choose to see the potential for learning, what is the limit for us to challenge our own current narrative about everyday things? So that's something for us to think about. Moving on to page two of this prologue, I want to talk about acceptance and why care can't exist without it. Now that we've taken these big, logical, rational ideas and we've challenged them, I want to talk more about the human side of caring. As I realize how much care is embedded in the fabric of our connection with other people, the more I start to understand the fundamentals of what makes us people. Now, I want you all to look at the person next to you. Like, really look at them. <laughs> By the time I even finished this sentence, you probably would have associated them with a few terms, whether that be their name, if you know it, their age, their gender, their identity. But we're so much more than that. You see, everyone in this room is so full of individuality and stories, and that's something that a label wouldn't be able to tell us. It's human instinct to want to categorize things into neat little boxes, and that's why we created labels, for the sake of simplicity. But what do we do when we come across something so fluid and complex, something like gender, something like personality? How do we then reduce these concepts into our menu of acceptable labels? So, on the left is the singer Harry Styles, and on the right is the actress Kate Blanchett. So as you can see, they're wearing outfits that aren't necessarily gender conforming. You know, he's wearing a dress and she's wearing a suit. But, and these things can be considered to be traditionally quite taboo. But does him embracing a more feminine style mean that he cannot be dominant and assertive? No. And equally, does her wearing a suit mean that she cannot be nurturing and sensitive? Also no. What they are doing is, they're actually dismantling gender stereotypes through fashion. And I think that's pretty cool. I think it's very important for us to recognize how fluid we are as people. 
and that things like individuality and gender expression, these are things that are really worth celebrating. Gender is something that we're taught about as kids, but we're taught a very limited amount of a concept that is truly unlimited. We were taught that there are two groups of people. You either fit into one or the other. But we're only given pieces of a puzzle, but never the full picture. We were taught that you're either masculine, you know, you're strong, you're a natural leader, you're assertive, or you're feminine. You're passive, you're nurturing, you're gentle. Two categories that describe everyone in this room, each and every one of you. Eight billion identities simplified into two. That's simply not possible. Because we are so diverse and fluid, care also means something very different to everyone, and therefore care itself is also very fluid. The reason why I say that acceptance is at the very core of care is because once we come into terms with the reality and we accept it without resistance, we stop fixating on why certain things don't fit into certain boxes, and only then can we really embrace the fluidity of being human. And only then can we see that care itself is also a very fluid entity that is constantly evolving. Care is always going to move with us. Now, for the last page of this prologue, I want to talk about practice. And this is the thing that really makes caring a verb. When it comes to our relationships with other people, care and love often go hand in hand. Whether that love be platonic, romantic, familial, a lot of the foundation is the same. I recently read this book called The Art of Loving by the German psychologist Eric Fromm. And in his book, he theorized that he, he almost likened modern dating to capitalism, a system based on the premise of mutual beneficial exchange. And what he theorized was that in order for someone to participate in the dating world, they would have to submerge into what he'd like to call the personality market. We then try to up our own market value by adhering to what others might desire. We might then change ourselves to become more lovable to a specific demographic of people, because at that point, we've already decided which market we're putting ourselves onto, and subsequently, the type of love that we're open to receiving. We might then try, try to strive and find a partner who can check all of our boxes, but then the selection pool just gets narrower and narrower. Love will start to feel a bit demoralizing if we're going to liken the self-interested pursuit of a partner to almost a bargain. You see, this system doesn't really treat people as people. This strategic, this strategic exchange doesn't treat people as people. We just end up becoming commodities of this personality market. So let's take a step back and really think about what love actually is at its core. Is love something that's passive or is it active? Or in other words, is love an independent state that exists independently and is waiting for us to stumble upon it? Or is it something that requires our own participation and effort to bring about? And I think a lot of people might still view love through a very passive lens. You know, someone who sees love passively might ask, how do I become loved? Whereas someone who views love actively might ask, how do I love? Rarely do they ever make us think about how we ourselves can improve as a lover and how we can implement that love into our lives. A lot of the time we take the notion of love for granted. We think that love is intuitively known and that it doesn't necessarily have to be learned, that it will just naturally feel it when the time comes. So maybe our solution is for us to shift our perspective and start seeing love as a verb rather than a noun. If anything, love is like an art. The same way that painting is an art. The same way that playing the piano is an art. It takes grit, patience, and faith. You can't be a good writer if you only choose to write when you feel like it. And equally, you can't be a good lover if you only choose to love when it's convenient and enjoyable for us. I think, for me at least, our connection with other people is one of the most beautifully intangible things that we'll ever get to experience in this lifetime. So when we give love, we're giving parts of us. Our passions, our experiences, our understanding, we're giving things that make up us. 
Care is something that takes practice and consistency. Now, we live in a world where everyone chimes in with their own ideas of how to see the world. And our generation, our voices, more than ever, is becoming such a key player in tackling a lot of these global issues. But a lot of these issues, they're very complex and they're very dimensional. And a lot of them have people at the very center of it. So it's more than crucial for us to go into it being really perceptive and open-minded. And more importantly, to not feel intimidated if our understanding is ever to be challenged. For me, writing the script for this talk itself was a roller coaster in itself, but in the best possible way. It really allowed me to redefine my definition of care. And I hope that I can also encourage some of you to become more introspective and to find the care in everything that you do. If you had to take away one thing today from my talk, let it be this. Care and understanding are hidden and intertwined within things that are incredibly simple and mundane. And if we look hard enough, we'll see that it has existed all along and is going to forever move with us as we grow as people. And now that we've seen the prologue to caring, let's turn over to chapter one and start writing our own story of caring. And to that I say, take care, everyone. Thank you.